This Week in Radio Tech, Episode 308, is brought to you by Lavo and the Crystal Clear Virtual Radio Console. Crystal Clear is the console with a multi-touch touchscreen interface. By the Omnia 11 FM HD audio processor. Get $500 off an Omnia 11 now and a free upgrade to the GeForce Dynamics engine. And by Axia AOIP audio consoles and routing systems. Now with fully compliant AES67 built in to Axia X nodes and consoles. Several incompatible audio over IP standards are popular in the marketplace. Which AOIP standard is best for a given audio application? Kettle Morstall of Soundware Norway compared the most popular AOIP systems on paper and by installing each. He joins Chris Tobin and Kirk Harnick on This Week in Radio Tech. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. Delighted to be here. And look where I am. It's, I've been here before. Uh, I'm in Orlando, Florida. And I'm uh, here as a guest of the folks at WPOZ, uh, Z88.3. Here, I'm about, you can see the, the logo back there, except for the mic's in the way. Uh, Z, Z, WPOZ typically is the number one station in Orlando, which is pretty amazing. And they very kindly uh, let me use some of their facilities, a, a room here with fantastic internet to, uh, to do the show. So I'm here, down here with the family on vacation and uh, wanted to make sure we got the show on the air because we got a great guest. So there you go. That's where I am. The weather, because sometimes we talk about the weather, right? The weather here, we had a deluge of a rainstorm about 20 minutes ago. Uh, the parking lot is still just sopping wet, but uh, you know, it's Florida. It happens you know, twice a day, right? Uh, so I'm sure it'll all be dried up by the time we, uh, we get out of here. Hey, uh, you've tuned into the show where we talk about broadcast technology, audio, uh, anything from the microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower, streaming, internet, digital radio, audio processing, all that stuff. And we've got a great topic today. We'll fill you in on that in just a minute. Let's bring in our co-host. He's been with me since show number one. It's uh, it's Chris Tobin from New York. Hey, Chris, how are you? I'm good, Kirk. Uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, well, as you can see behind me, the weather is overcast skies. We have not had any precipitation in several hours. And so far, there's a nice, cool breeze. Well, I shouldn't say cool. A uh, humid breeze, but it's, it's still comfortable. And uh, it's good. Feeling good. Well, good deal. Glad glad you could make it along. You you showed up just in time, and that's that's a that's a that's a delight. Uh, hey, down here in Florida, you know, I always forget about all the toll roads they have here, and around Orlando, especially. Oh my goodness, uh, I, I think I, I shelled out about ten bucks, uh, you know, a buck and a half at a time, <laughs> to get from where we're vacationing up to WPOZ. It's just amazing to stop every every four and a half minutes. It seems like to. To put money, there's got to. Well, I guess there is a more efficient way. If I had the Easy Pass thing on my car, you know, the the transponder thing uh, in the windshield, that would be better. Do you, you have a lot of toll roads there in, in the New York area, Chris? Oh yes, it's 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 known as the New York, New Jersey tri-state toll area. We have tolls everywhere. There's tolls probably for airspace above buildings. I'm not careful. <laughs> Yes, New Jersey Turnpike, Garden State Parkway. Uh, uh, let's see, the, what else is there? There's a George Washington Bridge, Lincoln Tunnel, Holland Tunnel. There's a small bridges in between the boroughs that have uh, tolls. So, yes, it's, it's, it's not a toll-free zone, that's for sure. So, I always say of the New York area is having mostly tolls on bridges and tunnels, but you do have some, uh, some, some interstate-type highways, right? Limited access highways that, that have tolls. Yes, yes, yes. The, okay. In New Jersey, it would be the New Jersey Turnpike. Garden State Parkway, to, to name two. Gotcha. Do, do, do they have a single Easy Pass kind of technology, or do you have to have several devices in your car to drive through the, the speed lanes? Well, you can use the uh, Easy Pass technology between states. There are uh, most of the tolls now are reciprocating between states. So yes, you could have a New York uh, Easy Pass and use it in New Jersey, and vice versa. Absolutely. Well, that's good. That's good. You know, there's, there's some places uh, here that if you don't have the right amount of change or an easy pass, you can't get off without breaking the law. I think well, that's I true. The there, there are some toll roads that. some toll roads around here now that no longer have an, a booth attendant, so yeah. you know, you're sort yeah. of stuck. Uh, but I, I, I should add to that, the easy pass does go far down into uh, Philadelphia. So if you're traveling from New York City to, on the toll roads to Philadelphia to Delaware, you could use your easy pass. By the way, uh, the radio station I'm at here, you might be interested to know, um, you know, Florida has thunderstorms almost every day. They have plenty of generator backup here at WPOZ, and they have a policy. They start and run the generator. In fact, they go to generator anytime there's lightning within 10 miles. That's got to be almost every day they're running on the generator for a while. Because, uh, yeah, 10 miles away, lightning, 
crank up the generator, switch, switch the UPS <laughs> input over to it. And so if you've seen my lights here in the building go out and come back on, the lights are not on the UPS. They're on generator or on commercial power, but they're not on the UPS. The internet connection is on the UPS, though, so hopefully you know, that stays up if the, if the power switches over or, or blips. So well, that's, that's interesting because something I've learned over the years is when you uh, cycle your UPS, you, you, know, you reduce the battery life. So I wonder what the cost of ownership of that UPS is if they're turning on generators, switching back and forth every time there's a, uh, a spot of lightning. Yeah, I wouldn't. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'll, I'll try to ask him, but it won't be during the show. So cool. Hey, so we've chit chat enough. Uh, I, I want, I'm told you I was excited about our guest. Let me give just a little bit of, of uh, work up to uh, introducing our guest. You know, there are we, we've been talking for years on the show about audio over IP, uh, both in terms of studio technologies for, you know, very low latency and for uh, external technologies like, you know, over the public Internet uh, or over private WANs and that kind of thing. So. Um, uh, and I work for the folks at, uh, at Telos, uh, which, which owns the Axia brand. Axia, uh, Livewire was invented, oh, 13 years, almost 14 years ago now. A couple of patents are out on the technology because it was the first uh, truly low-latency audio over IP technology. And for broadcast, you, know, you talk in the microphone, you hear yourself in the earphone, you've got to have some low latency there. Otherwise, it just sounds, it's totally confusing and you can't deal with it. And at the time that Livewire was invented, there were a couple of other technologies out there. Uh, they worked, but they weren't really meant for broadcast. They weren't meant for talking and listening at the same time. They were not low latency. And I think one of them wasn't routable. So it was, it was just not a solution that uh, broadcasters needed. So Livewire got invented. I'm just delighted to say that I work for the company that, that invented that. And it really changed the landscape. And it helped give rise to a number of, of competing technologies uh, that also had a lot of the features that Livewire had. Some have more features. And uh, now some have even more adoption, typically outside of broadcast, but in professional sound. So there's all these different technologies. There's, uh, um, uh, there's Livewire, Dante, a, uh, there's AES67, uh, there's Wheatnet, and there's Ravenna. So there's all these different technologies that are not, not exactly compatible with each other, but uh, at least we have the AES67 uh, standard that we can build to now. So that's a little bit of a setup. You know, we've got these different things. They don't quite work together, but they each have their own advantages and disadvantages. And I have not spent a great deal of time studying uh, you know, all about the others. I've got to know a lot about Livewire. I work for the company, and so I need to be able to speak uh, authoritatively about that. Uh, and, and Chris Tobin, you've probably had the same experience, too, since you've installed some Livewire gear, but you've also dealt with, dealt with some other technologies, too. Well, one uh, person who's uh, a friend of, uh, of the TELUS Alliance, but uh, also he sells equipment from a lot of other brands as well to uh, audio professionals, both in broadcast and out of broadcast. That guy is... Kettle Morstall, and he is uh, from Norway, works for the folks at Soundware in Norway, and so let's bring him in now. Kettle, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. I'm delighted you're here. Thanks for staying up late for us. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Uh, it's almost, uh, well, it's uh, one hour to midnight uh, approximately, and the sun has set, so uh, it's, uh, it's a beautiful uh, summer evening here in Norway. So ah. thanks for having me. Hey, uh, up where, where you live, uh, you're kind of far north there. I guess your summer days are pretty long, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, and, of course, the further up north you go, uh, you will literally have the sun shining 24 hours a day. Yeah, and that that would be again, amazing. Yeah. yeah, but then again, in the winter, it's pitch black uh, the whole day through. So you need to get adjusted a, a, a tiny bit to that one. It, it, can, that, be, it can be hard. That can be, uh, you know, I, as you know, I've, I've spent some time up in Riga, Latvia, at the Telos offices there. In the summertime, the sun doesn't go down until 1030 uh, in the evening. It doesn't really get dark until after that, but it comes up at four. But in the winter, oh, my goodness, people get a little depressed because they see the sun for three or four hours during the day. And uh, that's it. That's true. And uh, up north, where I'm originally uh, from, I mean, it's completely normal to inv invite your neighbors to a barbecue even uh, at two o'clock in the middle of the night because the sun's <laughs> shining and yeah, it's, why not? <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Well, uh, so we're here to talk about uh, audio over IP. And you know what? I, I, I need to, to take a quick break and talk about one of our sponsors. When we come back, Kettle, I want you to kind of set up uh, for us the reason why you made this study um, about the different technologies. And then we'll get into the different technologies and what their 
uh, advantages, their pros and cons are for different applications. So uh, uh, I appreciate you hanging on. Chris, uh, Chris Tobin is with us on episode uh, number 308 of This Week in Radio Tech. Our show is brought to you in part by the folks at Lavo, L-A-W-O. They're a co company that makes audio consoles for, uh, for broadcast, and they're the maker of the Crystal Clear audio console. And the Crystal Clear audio console is a kind of a new idea in, in audio consoles. Now, i got to tell you, 15, 18 years ago, uh, I was a, um, uh, a contract engineer. That was 20 years ago, come to think of it. And I was helping out the folks at Autotronics. And I always thought, man, wouldn't it be, be cool if you could make a touchscreen audio console? And the technology was not even there yet. I mean, McDonald's had just started introducing some touchscreen technology into some of their stores, and it just wasn't there yet at all. But now, 20 plus years later, oh my goodness, the touchscreen technology is there, including multi touch. And the screen actually figures out if you put, you know, three, four, five, even 10 fingers on the screen, it tracks all those just in, in real time. Well, the folks at Lavo have taken advantage of this touchscreen technology and real advances in it, the accuracy in it. You don't have to, you know, hit something multiple times. It just knows, you know, that your finger is there. And the, uh, you know, the touches are very appropriate in terms of how much you have to touch them. Uh, and you're not going to confuse it with multiple fingers because, like I said, it'll track 10 fingers at once. So they've developed the Crystal Clear audio console. You know, touchscreens are everywhere now. I mean, in, in, in airplane cockpits. And, uh, of course, we all, we all have smartphones and, and iPads and, then, and even larger uh, applications for, for touchscreens. So uh, the Crystal Clear console takes that technology. They designed a user interface that has nice, big, beautiful, viewable uh, faders and buttons that just make total sense uh, to touch and use that uh, menus pop up. Um, uh, very naturally, right next to the to the button, with only the contextual options that you may need at the time. So, if you're dealing with a microphone input, for example, you touch uh, an options button, and you just get uh, the options that would apply to dealing with a microphone. How about things like automatically setting the mic preamp level? You know, you ever had a problem with that? You get get somebody really loud in the studio, and they talk right up next to the microphone, and they're just blowing the mic preamp away, and and you can't get rid of that distortion if it's, you know, if it's distorting at the front of the preamp. Well, the folks at Lava figured this out. They have an auto setting there. You can have the person talk, push the auto button, and it'll auto range that mic preamp input uh, to be ideal for that particular person. Hey, that's really great when you're doing music in the studio. You have maybe a guitar, a violin, you have some drums in the background, and you just set these levels automatically, and then your, your fader will be in the right range, and you won't blow up the mic preamp with uh, too much audio going into it. So just features like that are what make the Crystal Clear really amazing. There's some optional features like dual power supplies. So you have, uh, you have dual redundant uh, power supplies in the, in the Crystal Clear console. Also, Ravenna and AES67 uh, compatibility is built into the Crystal Clear console. Uh, you get a certain number of uh, mic inputs, line inputs, line outputs, and AES in and out built into the back of the 1RU DSP unit. And then it connects via Ethernet uh, to anywhere you know, in the building, anywhere on the network that you want to put the, the crystal uh, part of the console, that is the, the multi-touch touchscreen, to take care of it. So check it out, the Lavo Crystal Clear Audio Console. Go to lavo.com, L-A-W-O, lavo.com, and look under Radio Products, and you'll find the Crystal Clear. Hey, you see, you see that web page on the screen? That's the one you're looking for. You see that, and you'll be there. You can also click on the video in the uh, right-hand uh, side, the right-hand column over there, where you'll see Mike Dosh describing uh, how the, uh, the Crystal Clear console works and its benefits uh, for you in, uh, in your setup. Check it out. Thanks to Lavo for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. All right, Kirk Harnack, Chris Tobin along here, and Kettle Morstall is our guest from Soundware in Norway. And so uh, Chris and I are going to listen while Kettle, you kind of... Bring us up to speed on your motivation for comparing the different IP audio systems. Tell us how you got started with this project. Well, originally it was um, it was a request from uh, from one of our customers, uh, which um, well, they ha they had the desire to go uh, all audio over IP is in one of their facilities, and uh, of course we needed to take in account their existing equipment. Um, there was quite some uh, don't uh, enable them. by don't I mean uh, don't by ordinate uh, there were quite some equipment from from with don't enabled 
uh, possibilities already, and they had some other stuff as well, uh, able to do audio over IP. So we sat down together with the customer and analyzed uh, w which equipment would he like to use further on and how it was to, to be used, I mean, in, uh, in total in, in this uh, little facility. So little by little, we started to uh, assemble blocks, so to say, with our knowledge. And uh, at the final end, we tried to build an actual proof of concept with uh, the same type of equipment. And uh, that gave us a couple of um, surprises, so to say. Um, and especially when it comes to, uh, to topics like uh, security and user friendliness, not to forget that one. Um, and also in comparison to other technologies, what they could offer. Um, well, they already had some live wire nodes already, and they were, of course, eager to move over to AES67, which uh, uh, for, for them sounded like to be, be the uh, salvation of interconnecting the Dante products with, uh, with the uh, other audio over IP systems. So we literally, we built a radio station in, uh, in our offices, in our lab, and we started to, to experiment. And uh, we found out that, uh, well, it maybe not, uh, it wasn't that easy after all to actually interconnect all the various technologies uh, together. Uh, that that's um, that's was the that that was the reason why we we actually did this. Ah, okay. So trying to connect uh, different brands with with different technologies to see how they might possibly work together. Uh, and I'm guessing you had not much luck until maybe until some AES67 equipment came along to connect uh, different brands together, right? Yeah, and that's um, th that was actually what we were hoping for, was that uh, AES67 would solve all the problems, as we have heard for quite some time that, um, that uh, Dante has now adopted AES67 and they were compatible and, and everything seems to be good to go. Uh, but then uh, we, uh, we discovered that um, even though some Dante products might be AES60 compatible, uh, and not necessarily any or all Dante products. Um, it turned out that uh, the manufacturer act themselves actually has to um, to to um, to get involved with Ordinate in order to make their product uh, products uh, AX67 compatible. So uh, for quite some time, uh, I think uh, ourselves. Uh, as, along with a lot of other people, so went uh, down the road and believed that uh, literally all Dante products were AES67 compatible, which is not the case. And that could definitely be a showstopper if, uh, if you start designing a studio with that in your mind and uh, not actually doing the tests and doing a proof of concepts by yourself. Uh, so that was a very important lesson to discover that uh, it was not the fact that all Dante products is AES60 compatible. And then uh, further on, we uh, discovered that, um, well, a in AES67, um, you have some mandatory, uh, you have some mandatory requests that you need to fulfill, and then you have some optionals. Mm -hmm. And uh, yet again, with, uh, with Dante, it seemed that they are doing their own set of the uh, advertisement of the audio streams, uh, which they either sends or receives. And these are not that easy to actually use when it comes to connecting a Dante unit together with a LiveWire unit. Um, so there was a lot of um, strange discoveries, so to say. Um, and at the final end, we actually found it easier to use uh, a Dante interface with AES uh, EBU output into, an, for instance, an X node with AES EBU. Uh, and we, we just had to skip the IP route in, one, in, a, in a couple of jumps just to uh. um, actually get the, the, the system up and running. And actually, it will, we, we should talk about this for a minute, the difference between being compliant and compatible. So we'll get to that in just a second, but I, I should uh, bring the audience maybe up to speed just a bit. You know, this AES-67 standard uh, came about because of uh, manufacturers realized, okay, we, we've, we've got a system that doesn't work 
with uh, brand B or brand C. And so we ought to have at least a minimal way that everyone can talk together. And so uh, the, I'm proud to say the folks at, at Telos were part of the, uh, you know, were the founding members of the committee that came up with the AES 67 standard. Plenty of other manufacturers were on board as well. And it, it never was a rubber stamp of any existing um, uh, standard. Uh, they all said, look, we're, all, we're each going to have to do some work. Uh, nobody can just uh, say, well, hey, mine works best. Let's just be compatible with mine. And so that didn't happen. And so um, uh, they came up with uh, this AES-67 standard uh, that, you're right, does in include some basic things that you absolutely must meet in terms of, you know, timing and, and, and packet size and the number of, of uh, packets per second uh, or frames per second, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the bit depth, the sample rate, all that kind of stuff, and where the clocking was going to come from. And so they, they really had to hammer all that out. Uh, and when they did, uh, you know, at first nobody was, was compliant or compatible, and various manufacturers uh, have worked toward, toward doing that. And uh, to, a, to a large degree, for example, I understand that the Ravenna standard uh, developed uh, in Europe was already mostly uh, compliant or, or compatible. And so, Kettle, I'd like for you to um, help us understand what is the difference between compliant and compatible uh, for AES-67, and, and what does that mean if you're choosing equipment? Should you look for compliant or should you look for compatible, or does it not matter? Tell us ab about that difference. Mm. Well, basically, I think the easiest way to explain it is to say that, uh, well, w when two technologies is compatible, uh, they can live together side by side, uh, and they might have some similarities, which allows some interconnection. It does not necessarily mean that it's compliant. And by being compliant, it's uh, literally that it's uh, fully integrated and can, could work together uh, on, on every level, uh, seamlessly as, as possible. Uh, so uh, there's no doubt that um, when designing systems, and uh, especially with, with something new as AES-67 is, it's definitely a compliant products or compliant products that you would, would go after. No, no doubt about that. That would ease uh, your job in, in all, you know, all phases of the design. Um, and you also mentioned like clocks and clocking of the, the, of the package systems and so on. And that's also a very important part of the uh, of our audio over IP system, where you start to have, for instance, in the one and same network, you have partially Dante, partially Livewire, some Ravenna technology, and on top of that, you have AES-67. And that could potentially become a disaster if you do not pay attention to the clocking of the system. Ah. And mm -hmm. And I guess word clock is, is quite uh, well known in the audio industry, but in this case we are talking about clocking of the packets in a network, and that's a different beast. Gotcha, gotcha. Chris Tobin, you've uh, worked with a number of different systems, including a big AES systems that had clocking. Myself, um, working for smaller radio stations in smaller markets, I, I never never really worked with clocking until Livewire came along and it just it just worked. You just plugged it in and uh, you know you could choose a master node or let them decide themselves and it just worked. So for me clocking has never been a problem because my little experience was that it just worked. Chris maybe you can help describe some of the issues that that you have with systems uh, of any kind of digital system that has to be clocked. Well let's see if you're talking a uh, word clock or clocking for audio workstations, like say if you're using Pro Tools, uh, systems of that sort, or maybe even Final Cut Pro, where you may be using SMPT for clocking purposes. Clocking is about timing of your source, your destination, what you're working with. I'm just doing the broad strokes. And I've done a lot of AES studios where the word clock was distributed, think of it as a master, like a master timing clock you'd use for your, say, ESE clocks, or, or for FOG, the old days of FOG, uh, the pulse clocks. So word <coughs> clocking is, is in that fashion the way it's used. And then in the world of IP now, you've got your timing and your clocking is taking place at the packet level. So again, it's all about uh, the timing and it's just we're moving forward. So an example that Kettle gave was, uh, you know, because the two devices aren't uh, compatible enough for the, the discovery to, to use to talk between them, they went AES, CBU between the boxes on that level, still got what they needed done, and that makes total sense. And then if the box requires clocking, 
Well, at the AES level, you can do clocking internally through the connection, or you can do an external. Uh, typically, you'll see like a BNC connector on some machines. Others, it's an mm -hmm. XLR connector. And you can provide a clock that way. So external sync, I guess you'll see it as. Uh, but clocking is important. And I think as we move more and more into the world of IP and audio, and I've done some video IP work, understanding clocking, or what is it, precise time protocol, PTP, I think it's called. Yeah, you know, yeah, we're going to do that, it's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's going to be important. Um, the trick is, as Kettle mentioned, you know, you, you got to do a proof of concept on some things you're doing. You've got to look at, I always look at the workflow. So if someone comes to me and says, hey, we want to do, and I had this last year, we want to use a, a live wire in this application, but we were told that we should be looking at something called Dante. And I said, really? Looking at their workflow, it turns out they were a performance facility where they were doing uh, performances for theater and some other stuff where the Dante products were very uh, readily available in what's called the AV world, we'll call it that. And then the, the other side that was requesting the live wire approach was because it was for the broadcast portion of what they did at the workflow. So I was like, oh, interesting. So in a way, you create two islands of full functionality and find a way to connect between them or you know, create a bridge across the lagoon, if you will. And uh, part of that will be timing. You may have to be you know, concerned with that because you're talking, say, we'll use the example of a theater. Theater uses all kinds of sources for lighting, for audio, for even visual, and they're all based on time. We in broadcast, for the most part, we plug in a device directly to the mixer or the desk, and then off we go. And then you know, the timing is built between the two devices, real simple. So uh, timing, timing will become uh, something of an issue to concern yourself with, or at least understand in different types of time. Word so clock, I, I, sync, I, PTP. I, <laughs> Yeah, so, so I, I want to talk about PTP for a second, and maybe Kettle can uh, give us a, a, an explanation here, because uh, I, I noticed that if you're going to be AES-67, you, you do involve this thing called PTP, Precise Time Protocol. I noticed that, that Dante uh, uh, seems to have this as well. So, Kettle, how, how can you uh, um, explain what PTP clock is to those of us who aren't real familiar with it? Well, um, th that was actually one of the biggest um, um, surprises I got when we started with this because um, from my audio background where, where word clock is word clock and everything is uh, pretty much straightforward, uh, PTP became a topic which uh, I spent considerably much time on because it's, it's so complex and it, there are so many uh, angles to be attacked uh, into it. But um, just as a start, uh, a PTP clocking protocol is more or less a master clock which sends out a message to your slave device and telling what the time is. And the slave device would then report back to the master clock and saying that this is my time and this is how much I need to adjust my time in order to be in sync with you. Ah. And this is all devices is talking to one master clock. And this again is divided into domains or different levels and, of course, different technologies. Um, and yeah, just to make it short, we got two uh, varieties, uh, which is uh, version 1 and version 2. Uh, and Dante is using version 1, while Livewire and Ravenna and AES67 is uh, using version 2. And version 1 and version 2 is not compatible and they are not compliant. Hmm. And they should they should not live together in a network as well. Wow. Okay. So, um, um, all right. Uh, I, I'm a little bit familiar that that um, uh, uh, Axial Livewire equipment can be a source of PTP clock. The the clocks that are built in, for example, to the X nodes are uh, fully accurate to be uh, to to provide PTP timing. Tell me how um, GPS signals play into the notion of of precise time protocol? Well, basically, uh, a master clock um, could also have a master above it, which is a grand master, and that is typically mm. fed by a stratum zero clock, which could be a GPS or a atomic clock of, of some sort. And that gives us the possibility to actually synchronize two sites, which is located hundreds of miles apart from each other and still maintaining the, the uh, packet time correctly. And, and the reason for that is that when you send a packet, it has a timestamp. And when, when this audio packet is received, then you are, can assure that you are actually receiving the packets in the right order and can assemble the audio stream back again correctly. 
Um, so this is back and forth negotiation uh, of the timing protocol uh, along with the UDP packets. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. That that makes some sense. Yeah, I, I wondered ab about that. So you you don't have to have a GPS or a Grandmaster reference, but if you want to connect sites that are physically separated from each other, where you don't have the possibility of extending the actual timing network, you know, hundreds of kilometers or miles somewhere else, but if they're both referencing, say, GPS signals, then they can both be in in perfect sync. Yeah. That's absolutely correct. Okay. And right. in, in some cases, you might not want to use a GPS clock. I mean, it all depends on how, how uh, afraid you are for, for GPS hacking attacks. I mean, if you, mm. if you consider that to be an issue, then you could use a, a free, free running master clock uh, anyway, if, if that's the uh, issue. Gotcha, uh, gotcha. So, mm -hmm. so one, one funny thing that, um, that Chris mentioned was that... Um, you also have the security level, and one one of the reasons why we were using uh, AES EVU back and forth or back to back between Dante and Alivewire system is also due to security. Um, An XLR connector is still today the world's best firewall between IT <laughs> systems. Yes, yes, it is. That's a good point. <laughs> Even your IT department would agree in that one. That I had not thought about that, but that that that's great. So here's a, yeah, here's a uh, here's an XLR connector right here, and there's no known hacks for that, are there? No, nope. nope. <laughs> And it's not even password protected, and yet it's secure, isn't it? <laughs> IT department would love it. <laughs> hey, you're watching or listening to uh, This Week in Radio Tech, episode number 308. It's Kirk Harnack here. I'm at the studios of WPOZ in Orlando, Florida. Uh, Chris Tobin is along. He is somewhere on a rooftop in the New York City area. And Kettle Morstall is with us. He's with uh, Soundware in Norway. And we're going to get into the meat and potatoes uh, in just a minute of comparing uh, what some of the different AOIP standards are good for. You know, what, is, what is Dante best at and what is it not so good at? What's Livewire good at, not so good at? What's uh, Ravenna and AES67? What, where are they best used and, and where, where are they best not used? So we'll come back and talk about that in just a minute. Our show brought to you in part by the folks at Omnia and the Omnia 11. Now you got to pay attention to this. Uh, the Omnia 11 you know, does one thing so well. It processes your audio for, for your FM transmission, and it is amazing at how well it does that. Well, version 3.0 of the software for Omni 11 is, uh, is just about ready to go. And there is no cost for the upgrade to version 3 of the software. And when you get version 3 on your Omni 11... Um, you have the possibility to do some upgrades that, uh, that, that, that could be cost upgrades. And one of them is the GeForce software that is uh, largely developed by my friend Cornelius Gould. Now, what is GeForce? Well, to, to put it as simply as I can, GeForce does uh, this, this dynamic equalization in a way that is totally different than the way multiband compressors work. And so what it does is it takes a lot of the work the off of multiband compressors in which you can get density buildup that you may not want. So using the G-Force uh, dynamic equalization, you can get the signature sound that you want without forcing the compressors, the multiband compressors, to do that. Now, uh, that's a little bit of a, uh, of a, of a wide explanation. We're going to have Cornelius Gould on the show in a few weeks to explain this more carefully to us, uh, exactly how this works as, in as much detail as he can give. And, uh, uh, but th the point is that people who have beta tested this G4 software, amazing. They, you know, years ago when the Omni 11 came out, we, we said, compared to other processors, it sounds effortlessly loud. Effortlessly loud was the, the, the moniker that actually customers had used on us. We didn't come up with that. Customers did. And the Omni 11 G-Force plug-in takes that one step further. Now it is even more effortless and still loud. It gives you the signature sound that you want without negative side effects. In fact, as Corny says, you hear the voice, you hear the music, you don't hear the processor. And my goodness, that's, that's the dream for you know, audio engineers. You want it to sound consistent and, and consistently loud where you can hear it all the time and yet it sounds very, very natural. So there's a deal going on right now at, uh, at, at Omnia and that is if you buy an Omnia 11, when GeForce is available, you'll get upgraded to that for free. 
So check out that deal. Check with your nearest dealer for Omnia and see what they have to offer you on pricing. Uh, if there's any special pricing that they may be able to offer you and the free upgrade when GeForce becomes available. There's one more option that's uh, uh, that'll be available soon, and that is the Perfect Declipper. And this is um, uh, some of the declipping technology that's in the Omnia 9. Uh, some of that upgraded will be available in the Omnia 11. So we'd like you to uh, check that out. You can go to the website and read about it. Uh, go to telosalliance.com, click on Omnia, and then click on the Omnia 11. And uh, you'll read all about the, the sneak peek for the Omni 11 processing platform and the, uh, the GeForce Dynamics engine and then the Perfect D Clipper option as well. And stay tuned because uh, Cornelius Gould is going to join us on a future episode to talk about GeForce. You know, Corny has been designing processing for over 20 years. And w this, this GeForce relates to basically his earliest de desires about what processing should do and how it should sound. So finally, after literally a couple of decades, the technology is available and the research time was available for Corny to implement his dream of dynamic uh, of, of EQ Dynamics, an EQ Dynamics engine. And so that's what's been put into the G-Force, and it is just amazing. At the NAB show, uh, people were, and at Broadcast Asia, people were just swamping uh, the, uh, the demo area to hear this. Uh, thanks very much to Omnia for uh, sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. So check out GeForce for the new uh, or for the Omni 11. GeForce coming out very very soon. All right, we're talking with uh, Kettle Morstall and Chris Tobin about AOIP, audio over IP, and the differences, the pluses and minuses in the different technologies. And so, uh, uh, Kettle, I don't want to run out of time on the show, so let's jump right into pros and cons for each. You've you've separated out Dante, Livewire, Ravenna, and AES67 as to what their strong points are and what their weak points are. Would you like to pick out a few of each and, uh, and carry us through that, uh, that examination? Yeah, I can do that. Otherwise, we would uh, still continue in the early morning tomorrow. So um, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> de definitely. Uh, when it comes to audio over IP and the various technologies, there's always some pros and cons. And um, especially in this case, we were only looking um, from a perspective of a, a broadcast client. And, and I think this is important to, to, uh, to underline that, uh, I mean, all these technologies definitely has their space in the audio over IP uh, sphere, but uh, some of them is really better at it than others. And uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that any uh, of the other technologies is better or, or, uh, or worse than the others, but it's just about the application where it should be used. Exactly. And one, one of the things we discovered by Dante is that um, you have, as soon as you have the router controller installed, you have literally access to any unit, any Dante unit in your setup, regardless of what your role or what your function in, in a facility is. And that would mean that uh, the, um, the guy picking up the phone uh, or, or even the uh, technical manager or a studio tech would have access to the exactly same router and there are no levels of user management in that router. And it can be quite nasty because you don't either have any undo function. So if you manage to set a cross point wrongly, then there are really no easy way to undo that and revert back to the uh, previous uh, state. Um, and of course, on top of that, there's not even a, a possibility to, to set administrator rights or, uh, or to lock the cross point. So it's totally open for anyone who has this software installed. And with uh, Dante, which has now approximately eight or 900 different products out in the market, uh, you would definitely meet someone with a Dante controller installed on their laptop and they are visiting your studio facility and plugging a cable into your network and there you are. You have no security whatsoever. And from a security point of view, that made it quite obvious that uh, we we would try to avoid using Dante in a, in a, in a really complex and big setup. Uh, so in this case, at this particular customer, we built uh, small islands with Dante uh, technology and then we interface them towards the uh, rest of the systems by using uh, Axia X nodes and using AES EBU, uh, both as a firewall and also 
for some other reasons that we could get back to. Um, and also another thing we discovered um, in our test lab, uh, and since most of the customers is doing uh, virtualization of their computers and service and everything, uh, it turned out that the Dante virtual audio card cannot be installed on a virtual computer. Mm. So that was quite a showstopper. Uh, hmm. So it, it can be installed on, on a dedicated computer uh, that's, just, yeah. that's just got one OS on it, but if it's a virtual machine, you say it can't be installed there. Nope, not possible. Yeah, interesting. So it actually it, it refuses to install on the, regardless if it's, uh, it's uh, Microsoft Hyper-V or if it's a VMware or whatever. So in a broadcast facility where you would definitely would like to save space and complexity and you would like to distribute your computer processing and so on, uh, that was also one of the showstoppers where, um, that we discovered. Um, but then again, uh, of course, Dante has its, uh, has its uh, very good points as well, and especially for AV installation, fixed installs, smaller studios, venues, and so on. It's definitely a very good and very easy, um, very easy system to use. And with like 800 different products available, it's, uh, it's really a no-brainer for that kind of market. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, so, yeah, it, it definitely has its space um, in, in the industry. But for broadcast, I would be quite reluctant to, uh, to move forward uh, using Dante. Um, also, one of the other things we discovered was that this uh, huge matrix in Dante, there's no way to control it by third-party systems. Mm -hmm. So, that being a control system, a high-level control management system taking care of all your sources and and destinations and so on. It's just not possible. So that's... So, um, uh, uh, so, so, and I've always considered Dante to be um, really embedded in the, in the pro-sound world and not, not for the peculiarities of broadcast. And some of the things you're telling me re just reinforce that, that feeling, that it's an extraordinary... It's very useful in pro-sound recording and, and all the things that are not... A lot of the things that are not broadcast-specific. Would I be right in that? Absolutely. And there's one main difference between a, 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 a theater install and a broadcast install. And in a theater or on a venue, uh, if, if you have an a audio router, it's most likely to be fixed and not be touched uh, during show. I mean, mm. uh, but while in broadcast, you would definitely touch your routers while you're hot on air uh, throughout the system. Uh, so I think the best way to, to think of Dante is actually as a huge, huge multi-cable, a huge analog multi-cable going from A to B, and that's it. So the routing has to be done in the external equipment being connected to the Dante system. So um, let's let's. Uh, but, but unfortunately, I wish we like you said we, we could go on for hours in the wee hours in the morning. Let's move on to you want to move on to Ravenna. <coughs> uh, I'd like to save Livewire for last. Uh, actually, our last commercial will be about Livewire anyway. But uh, so I want to hear what's good and bad there. Uh, but let's talk about Ravenna. Ravenna was. Uh, uh, it invented in, in Europe and uh, with some, uh, we feel like, I felt, always felt like some European sensibilities uh, about, about the standard. Uh, so let's talk a bit about, about Ravenna and its capabilities. Hmm. Well, we, uh, we investigated uh, Ravenna products as well during uh, our proof of concept. And in our lab here, we do have all technologies available. So we are also able to uh, to test and try as soon as there's a new software release uh, because it might be that uh, what I'm telling you today is not necessarily the fact tomorrow so uh, mm -hmm. it's quite important to uh, to uh, get on the wagon and actually follow uh, closely what's happened um, and as for Dante we found that um, there's really not that much or many products available yet doing Dante, but there seems to be a lot in the, in the pipeline. And there's one important thing I forgot to mention uh, uh, for our proof of concept, and that uh -huh. is that we took, we, we were looking at products and technologies that do exist. We were not evaluating 
promiseware or vaporware or futureware or something like that. We, we took physical products available off the shelf today. Um, and at that time, which is now six months ago, there was really not that many products uh, available. And those available is quite expensive per unit, but on the other side, they have quite high channel counts, can have. Um, and, and that's, of course, one of the uh, um, advantages is the uh, flexibility when it comes to uh, high-res um, sample rates and bit depths, which is uh, definitely possible with, uh, with Ravenna. So if you're doing like uh, high-end classical recordings or uh, ingest of high-res material, that's definitely a, a product to look into. Um, but then again, uh, as third-party control in broadcast environment, it's, it's quite crucial to have as few control systems as possible, but still have full control. And for Ravenna, it seems that it's only able to be controlled by um, uh, Ember, Ember Plus. Ah, uh, mm. And the number of control systems able to handle Ember Plus is quite limited and the price tag is not limited. It's uh, it's quite high. Yeah, yeah. We and, and actually um, at uh, at at Axia, we looked at adding the Ember Plus control protocols to our existing LiveWire control protocols. And you know they're very they're very good. Uh, they're well thought out. But implement you know you, you spend all your time uh, working on your own control protocol, and it's a little bit hard to think about now adding somebody else's you know, entire uh, protocol to, to, to your gear as well. So I can certainly understand any manufacturer's reluctance to add something big on top of what they've already spent years developing. Uh, so this, this does make for a bit of a problem with, with uh, uh, incompatibilities in, in control. And, people, and companies design their control what, for what they believe their customers' needs are. Well, guess what? The folks at Ravenna may have had different customers than the folks at, uh, at, at, at Dante or at, at Livewire. Exactly. And, and that's my point. I mean, uh, all technologies do have their um, uh, assets as long as they are used where they are actually meant to be used. And, mm -hmm. and they all have a space where, the, where they do belong. Um, but then again, uh, Ravenna being fully live wire compliant, and it's quite a breeze to set a communication path between... Uh, between a live wire or an Axia product and a Ravenna product, uh, either by using live wire or Ravenna, uh, which is quite similar. Uh, uh, the Axia node speaks uh, Ravenna, and the Ravenna mm -hmm. stuff uh, talks to to live wire. So it's uh, it's very easy. I'm I'm, uh, I'm delighted to uh, to mention that 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 is the result of years ago, like five six years ago, uh, 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 the first real effort. I, as far as I know, to get two competing systems to talk to each other and uh, the, the folks at, at uh, you know, my bosses at, at, at the TELUS Alliance uh, met with uh, the folks at, with, with the Ravenna project <laughs> and decided these really should talk to each other. Let's see what we can do. And a press conference was held and, you know, it, it still took a long time to, to get some compatibility, but some com compatibility was, uh, was gotten there. And so they do talk to each other. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, well, so, so Ravenna as well do have their space in the industry where it uh, definitely uh, shines as a bright star. That's no doubt about that. Um, but then again, um, there are certain issues like no signaling or GPIOs being embedded or, or transmitted along with audio. Uh, then again, you are fully dependent on, uh, on Ember Plus, and which would mean uh, that you have to invest in quite an expensive um, control system. Mm. So for this particular customer, which already had quite some equipment already in the facility, uh, it would literally mean that they would throw out, uh, throw out everything or most of it. And that was not the desire for, for, for this customer. So, uh, in in your document, you provided to us, and and we, if if it's okay with you, we're gonna we'd like to put your uh, uh, one of these documents at least uh, in the show notes for the show. I'll, I'll 
talk to you about that after the show. Uh, but some of the pros of Ravenna, live wire compatible, many sample rates and bit depths. So it's an open protocol, internal clocking, discovery is there, low delay, uh, password protected units, native multicast. All these things are part of Ravenna. Uh, part of Ravenna. So that sounds a bit like, like live wire, actually. So that's maybe why they're, they're pretty compatible at this point. Um, would you like to move on to uh, Livewire and then follow, finish up with AES67, <laughs> actually, since that's kind of the, uh, the one ring to rule them all, <laughs> or at least get them to talk to each other? Absolutely. Um, when, when it comes to, uh, to Livewire, I mean, the, it's, it's quite obvious, I would say. Uh, it has the sample rates and bit depths, which is considered to be broadcast standard. I mean, it's 24-bit, uh, uh, 48 kilohertz. And um, it has its GPIO and signaling along the way. Um, but if, unfortunately, and, and I think it's too bad, it's, it's really not that many live wire products uh, out in the field. Um, there are quite some products which is based on the software uh, side of it, a like computer-based system. Um, but of course, I would like to see more hardware, uh, which also seems to be easier to, uh, to uh, handle AES67. Uh, Computer-based uh, products is not that easy to get AES67 up and running on. Ah. Um, <laughs> and that is actually due to the PTP timing protocol. Um, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, the, that PTP uh, is easier for a, a, piece of, a little piece of dedicated hardware to deal with. Uh, but uh, for the, the uh, a computer where you have uh, uncertain uh, uh, you know, interrupt schedules, uh, it's very difficult to do real-time processes uh, that fast. I, although, you know, I, I was privy to some internal <laughs> discussions at, at, uh, at Telos where our engineers are talking about some very little documented features in Windows that may actually help the situation out quite a bit. So I, I, I guess I would say stay tuned for news on that because uh, there are some features in, in Windows that, uh, again, very little documented uh, that, that may offer some uh, help to people who want to implement AES67 in a Windows environment. So... Uh, yep. uh, so anyway, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. So yeah, so not not a lot of hardware is available, and uh, yeah, it's it's tough to get somebody else to <laughs> to uh, build. You know, they think they think of you as a competitor, and so they don't want to build something that has your live wire built in. But we did get uh, you know uh, radio systems built uh, some consoles that have live wire. Uh, International Data Casting, a satellite manufacturer, uh, put uh, live wire in there. Nautel, uh, their transmitters, uh, a, a, a range of them have. Live wire uh, jack built into them, and we've had other transmitter manufacturers uh, ask us, "How do we do this? How do we do this?" And and and, and you probably already know this, but just so the audience knows, um, uh, Telos has for years offered a module, a hardware module that uh, is available either for use as is or as a model for how to design a live wire interface. Uh, to, that a, a manufacturer could use uh, in there, so it's it's a it's a uh, you know demonstration kit, if you will. Yeah, it's it's uh, smaller it's it's smaller than a Raspberry Pi, and uh, and it provides uh, 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 hardware interoperability with the live wire network. So those things are there. And as you mentioned, uh, with the driver, many different um, software manufacturers uh, who make automation systems, for example, have implemented live wire. But I feel your frustration. There's there's just not a lot of third-party hardware out there that, that plugs into a live wire. Well, there are actually Studer consoles, uh, which is quite popular in Europe, uh, do oh. have a live wire interface. That's true. I so remember that now. Yeah. yeah. They, they do exist. Well, I, th I think the main problem with the software drivers is that, uh, well, uh, going back to the PTP protocol and everything, uh, PTP is actually, uh, in its best case, it's measured directly on the network interface. So it's uh, it's a measurement which takes place between between the physical layer on the IP uh, stream or the network, so to see, say, and and the uh, and the interface itself. So it's it's very very low down into the uh, into the software stack, or it's based on the hardware actually. Uh, so that makes it very difficult to measure correctly on a network card. It has to be some specific <coughs> network cards which is able to um, to respond to the PTP timings. 
Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, well, we better move on to uh. AES 67 and look at its strong points and weak points as well, since that's a, a standard that people uh, are using to connect to each other. Tell us about that. Yeah. Um, as I said previously, when uh, we, we, tr we, we believed that uh, as soon as there was an AES 67 stamp on a specific vendor's product, we took for granted that this, this would uh, actually work, and we discovered that uh, that wasn't not necessarily so. So I'm a, I don't know if I should put it that way, that it, there are some false advertisements, but at least the, the common uh, perceptions seem to be that, uh, oh, everything is AES67 compatible or compliant, and now it it's, uh, should be a breeze to interconnect these units together. And mm. it might not be that easy. I mean, mm. it, it's a very, very good idea. And even some of the video over IP standards describe AES67 as the preferred way of uh, transporting audio. So mm. uh, I think especially for the um, video over IP, we'll definitely get a bit of a surprise when they start to, to implement audio uh, with the video as well. So. So that's uh, uh, definitely um, something to uh, to consider. And what we also have seen that is that um, when it comes to AS67 unicast, there are really not that many products or vendors able to do AS67 unicast at the moment. Um, I think it's only Oxia and I've seen some Ravenna interfaces able mm. to do unicast. Apart from that, it's all... Could you, and, and Chris, feel welcome to butt in here. Um, what, what's, because of course, the great application for multicast is in a studio environment where you have uh, one, you know, you have some given source of audio coming into your network, and you want to pick that source up at several different places uh, throughout, throughout your facility. Maybe it's a network feed uh, that you want to be able to have in every control room, and multicast handles that just great. Where is unicast really useful, and why would a person want to choose that over? Over a multicast way of, of distributing audio? Well, it has a number of, uh, of uh, advantages. And uh, one is, for instance, um, let's say that you have a microphone node um, and you don't necessarily would like to have that microphone available to all sources or all places in a, in a facility. I mean, that's, uh, that could be considered to be a security uh, risk. Uh, and especially for a guy or, or a person sitting behind a microphone and not knowing that anyone is listening to this microphone, mm -hmm. uh, so it could get quite disastrous. That's uh, that might be the best uh, best use case I have found. I, I, and I'm under the impression, and I haven't proven this out, but I'm under the impression that with Unicast, you may be able to. Um, uh, to get by with uh, uh, m maybe less assured clocking on both ends. So if if you wanted to send audio uh, quite some distance, could you would you want to use unicast? And uh, especially if the if the network you're going over doesn't support multicast, uh, then you, then you couldn't use that. Yeah, yeah, that that's true. And we we did a couple of installations um, uh, for a client which has two offices located. <clears throat> quite some um, miles apart, but still within their own network. Um, uh -huh. And they do have a leased fiber, dark fiber. But it turned out that this dark fiber is not that dark after all. <laughs> uh, there are amplifiers and there are switchers and there are some uh, uh, technology inside this dark fiber which you need to take care of. So in this case, it was all sold by going uh, unicast, and then nobody really had to care about multicast, unicast, and so on. Um, and we even did some tests between two cities using uh, internet, straight internet connection between two X nodes communicating by a uh, unicast, and that worked quite okay. Really? Okay. <laughs> well, that's what I've that's what I've heard, and and I I understand that um, during the Sochi Olympics, I believe it was uh, uh, Swedish radio <coughs> that used. Um, uh, X nodes in a unicast mode to send linear audio uh, over a fiber network from Sochi uh, to, uh, to to Sweden. So, yes, I, I heard so by using uh, mm -hmm. yeah IP tunnel uh, network. So, uh, 
Yeah. So, uh, so you have a, a more reliable connection, or you have a two-way communication with handshake and, and everything. So it seems to be more stable, definitely. Chris, uh, you, you have got to be the, the, the most patient co-host in the world. <laughs> I, I I know you've you've got experience in this stuff and stuff to say and and I, I appreciate we we both giving uh, Kettle a, a, a chance to talk here and and share his his knowledge. We're going to be out of time before too long. Chris, what what do you have to uh, add or or ask at this point? Well, I will add because uh, I don't need to ask because Kettle has, has touched all all the data points, if you will. I will say this: I've learned over the last several years with the new technology of IP. Our traditional methods in broadcasting of buying a single source technology to facilitate the plant's needs, I think, is gone. I, listening, reading the documents, and over the last year talking to folks, I could see a world where a broadcast facility could be live wire, say, uh, in, in the broadcast infrastructure, but maybe Dante or Ravenna for the non broadcast slash, we'll call it. Uh, theater, performance, audiovisual, And I say that only because I have several sound magazines I, I subscribe to. And I can't tell you how many times I see a, an application for their microphones with a single Dante connection <laughs> or, 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 or power amplifiers or speakers and things that would make total sense in some uh, broadcast facilities, but not in the studio, but maybe in the office environment. And, and I think that a high security XLR bridge would be a great way to give the general <coughs> manager's office, sales office, flexibility Dante or Ravenna may offer, but protect the broadcast island. So I, I'm, I'm leaning more toward now considering the island approach on some projects, which makes a lot of more sense. Other than that, I, I just everything we've talked about today is just makes total sense. Know more about the protocols, where they go, not go, whether it's compatibility or not. Do you, you, know, do you have to have every box in the rack talking at an IP level for compatibility, or do you do the method of Maybe an XLR bridge into a node, into a, a, a router or something else, and just go from there and, and mix and match. But still have, at the end of the day, it's about the workflow. You know, what are you trying to accomplish? I mean, aside from making money with the workflow. Folks, you are uh, watching or listening to This Week in Radio Tech, episode number 308. Our guest is Kettle Morstall from, uh, from uh, Norway, from Soundware in Norway. And he... Uh, went to the work to really compare uh, pros and cons of uh, the, the different AOIP standards. We're going to be back in just a moment with a final word from Kettle. So, K Kettle, I'm warning you. <laughs> See if you can have a final word for us. I'm sorry I didn't tell you about this earlier. And uh, and same thing for, for Chris Tobin. Uh, Chris always has a great uh, dovetail idea that, uh, that works with uh, what our guest says. And I've got my own thought uh, about this as well, which... It still hasn't changed much uh, over the years, uh, d despite, uh, you know, well, even been bolstered by the different uh, pieces of information that I've heard. So if you're building studios and you've got uh, various equipment that you want to implement into it, uh, uh, you know, I've got my advice for that as well. Hey, our show is brought to you in part by the folks at, at Axia. They are, yeah, the inventors of Livewire, and now it's called Livewire Plus. Livewire Plus is is the original Livewire, and the the different uh, bit rates that are different packet rates that go in with that. Uh but we've added AES67 to it. So now, in the live wire environment, here's what you can do. Uh, you can still get source advertising and GPIO, uh, two things that are not included in the AES67 standard. But if you need to use an AES67 stream type uh, between two devices, you can do that. Uh, that's one of the beauties of Livewire Plus, and since the folks at Axia uh, built Livewire to frankly, have a selection of stream types. And so when AES-67 came along, the guys at, at Axia thought, well, hey, this we're not going to make this a little island unto itself, this AES-67 operation. We'll just make that another stream type available in the live wire environment. And so it's really convenient, or as convenient as it can be, to use AES-67 devices. And I got to see my first one, believe it or not, at the, uh, at the NAB show. I don't get up to Cleveland, Ohio real often, so I don't get to see the R&D guys there as often as I'd like to. So at the NAB show this last April in Las Vegas, we had some uh, Genelec speakers uh, right there uh, on the stand with us. And we had the latest software in uh, our, um, our smaller consoles, the IQ and the Radius. So now in the... In the, the engine, the Core 16 or the Core 32 engine, there's built-in AES-67 um, uh, uh, compliant 
uh, stream ingest and generation built into that. So you no longer have to cycle this through an X node to get AES67 streams. It does it right there in, in the console engine. So, bottom line, we had two Genelec speakers. And what was going to each Genelec? Power, because they have a built-in power amp, so power and Ethernet. And it wasn't AES67, you know, over a, uh, an RJ45 connector uh, or even analog. It was real IP. And so uh, we use um, uh, Bonjour for discovery of the devices out there. And then once you do discover the device, you can configure it for the AES67 stream that it's going to receive or su subscribe to. And so it just worked great. So we had them on the whole show. And, and uh, uh, hats off to the folks at Genelec for making these uh, AES67 speakers. Well, that's just, I, I just want to talk to about the leadership that the folks at, uh, at Axia uh, have shown in, in this whole AOIP thing. You know, first inventing it to begin with, the low latency, uh, it, getting patents on how to make the, the clocking work over a jittery network, and then making the standard available to other manufacturers uh, at, frankly, a, just a, a pittance of, of a price. I mean, not even a, not even a, a royalty. So any manufacturer uh, could uh, Im implement uh, uh, live wire in there. And then being part of developing AES67, developing that standard with the Audio Engineering Society on a, on a working group there. And then finally, implementing it into products already. So it, it, it's in X nodes and has been for a long time. And now it's in uh, the audio consoles that use the, the core engine. And also it's in the Fusion uh, and Element consoles as well. So it's, it's uh, actually it's coming out in the next few weeks. So... Uh, all this built in, you can see that the folks at Livewire are solidly behind uh, engineers in their desire to connect various pieces of equipment together. And that's what the folks at uh, Livewire, that was our founder, Steve Church's dream, was that, hey, someday everything's going to have an, an IP connection on it. And uh, we're going to need to talk over that IP connection, and people are going to want to use different standards to get that done. So that's, that's what, uh, you know, Livewire's got Ravenna built in and... AES67 <laughs> built in. So you can see we're really making an effort to make that happen. And for those reasons, I really think you ought to consider Axia Gear uh, for your studios when you're building something new, when you want to make a long distance connection over IP, uh, when you want to build, if you just want to build a router uh, uh, out of uh, some nodes, uh, easy to do with, uh, with Livewire and, uh, and Axia Gear. So I really appreciate Axia for their leadership. Uh, really appreciate them for employing me and for uh, their, their moving ahead with AES67 to make the broadcast world a better place for people like you and people like me. All right. Thanks to Axia for sponsoring the show. All right. We're going to wrap it up here quickly. Kettle, would you please leave our, uh, our uh, audience with a, a final word about your, your studies and discoveries? It's very easy. It's, it's very, very, very easy. Uh, as soon as you start planning an audio over IP system, you have to test before you deploy it or for, before you start ordering products. It has to be tested. It has to be verified that everything works as you expect. Gotcha. All right. Testing. I, I agree with that. I've flown by the seat of my pants enough to, to, to know that you, you better make sure it works before you put it on there. And, and do some switching. Test it in various ways and see what you, if you can turn something off and it still works and you know, what's going to make it fail, if, if anything. So good advice. Chris Tobin, how about you? Do you have a tip or something for our uh, audience? Uh, uh, a simple tip for the audience is a reminder that Studio Hub products are real handy when it comes to... Uh, interfacing and testing stuff so if you want to keep your toolbox handy uh, I've been finding lately the uh, XLR to RJ45 and a couple of the uh, tip ring sleeve adapters have been very handy in troubleshooting since my environments I've worked in are starting to have a lot of uh, Cat5 cables between devices and uh, it, it's, it's handy I mean I've worked with a couple of uh, remote production folks lately and they're using the Cat5 snakes just for analog audio and then when there's a yeah, problem you say yeah. oh wow I got a Cat5 connector and eight audio pads in there but well, how do I talk to it? Oh, yes, my Studio Hub adapter. Actually, one of the guys I worked with looked at me. He's like, what is that? It's like, oh, I'm just checking out the audio on each pair. He's like, oh, that's cool. So just a reminder that sometimes the things we overlook it could be something real straightforward and handy in a crisis situation sometimes. But also, to reiterate what Kettle says, uh, if, you do, if you are building a facility, testing things out, uh, test 100%. And even consider testing the backups that you plan on installing and having as a standby and do the utility test, power utility. Unplug it while it's on. Don't turn it off and then unplug it. Just 
pull it off and psych- see how it recovers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good, good advice. And my own piece of advice, uh, and I've, I've said this for a long time, is ever since we knew that AES-67 was coming out, and, and, and that is that uh, probably I, I think one of the best ways to build studios is to pick a standard. You know, if, if you're going to go with a, a manufacturer, uh, and I'll, I'll use Axie as an example, uh, they're a sponsor, and I'll, I'll be glad to use them. You know, if you're going to build a studio, make it all live wire. You know, use nodes to talk to uh, analog or AES devices, uh, and and even you know several studios. If it's all the same standard, it's it becomes really easy. You get to work within that manufacturer's environment and and the way they planned for you to hook things up. But when you have to talk to something odd, something weird, or just something different, Different, especially something maybe in a different studio across town in another part of the building, uh, a microwave shot away. Then you're looking at perhaps using Ravenna or AES67 uh, to connect those things together. And uh, maybe you're going to connect to a a live sound studio where everything is in the Dante world there. And you you know what? You may have to just go down to uh, say go down to. I mean it's high quality. Go to AES67 on an XLR connector as that interface. It's not the end of the world. You know, it's you, it's you still you you still got the audio quality there. You may not have the convenience of typing something in a in a browser and doing something with the Dante system, uh, but you do have that high quality audio connection. So uh, don't don't fret. And I've got a few friends who do. Don't fret that everything isn't AES sixty seven. Stick with you know the the pluses of the manufacturer that you want to go with, and then use these other standards to hook, hook things together uh, that need to be hooked together differently. And uh, hey, agree or disagree, that's, that's my feeling about it, and it's worked well for me. All right, we gotta, we got to go. Uh, Kettle, thank you so much for staying up. It's past midnight now. I know you've got kids at home that probably want to see their dad, and, and uh, so I uh, hope you get home and give them a little kiss before you go to bed tonight. I hope they're already sleeping. Yeah, they better be, yes. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. Chris Tobin, thank you so much for joining us from the New York City area. You're, are you on a rooftop? I'm on a rooftop at a radio station. Uh, actually, my plan today was to try and do a wireless Wi-Fi 5.8 uh, point-to-point, but uh, the weather conditions, I decided, eh, I'll abandon it. So I'm just doing a wired Ethernet on a rooftop, and uh, Manhattan skyline's behind me. But the, the weather conditions have flooded out, the, uh, blown out the, the camera, so it, all uh. you see is white. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. I hear you. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. Kettle, again, I appreciate you staying up and, and joining us. Uh, and uh, I'm going to, uh, well, I can ask you right now, uh, the three documents that you sent me, can I put put those on our show notes? Yeah, please. Just be, okay. um, just, re- just remember that uh, the, this is uh, what was written today and it might change tomorrow. Exactly, and I, I'll, I will mention that exactly. So uh, uh, those of you interested in delving deeper than we were able to talk about everything <laughs> today, you can look at uh, three slides from a presentation that, uh, that Kettle did and, uh, and uh, you know, look at these pluses and minuses for yourself, and also a slide on, on how uh, PTP uh, uh, works, and uh, that's, that's pretty interesting too, ver- version two. All right, thanks to our sponsors. We appreciate them very much, and Suncast for producing the show flawlessly today. Thanks so much. It's great to have you uh, doing that. And uh, we hope you'll join us next week for This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye, everybody.